everyone, and we are live. Welcome back to the Improve Ed podcast, where we are looking to push the evolution of education through conversations with rock star teachers. My name is Justin Coffey, and I'm an assistant principal at Ulysses High School in Ulysses, Kansas. And you can find me on Twitter at Justin B. Coffey. And I'm Jen Farr. I teach fifth grade in Junction City, Kansas, Erie County. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Jennifer M. Farr. Perfect. And Jennifer, we have a rock star teacher um, on our hands today. In fact, one of our nation's very best teachers, um, a teacher leader and someone who I look up to a lot and learn a lot from every time I talk to her. So I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce her, Jennifer. All right. Well, Sarah Brown Wesley is a 21-year veteran of high school English classroom. And while a member of the faculty at Johnston High School in Johnston, Iowa, she taught courses ranging from at-risk to advanced placement and has served as the department and district in a variety of leadership roles. She's a national board certified teacher since 2005 and 2010 was our national teacher of the year. So in that capacity, she worked as the ambassador for education, giving over 250 talks and workshops in 39 different states and internationally. She is lucky to maintain a hybrid teaching position, which keeps her in the classroom, but allows her to speak write and work on teacher leadership initiatives around the country. Um, she also works with a nonprofit teaching channel and is the author of the Supporting Students in Time of Core Standards and maintains a blog, Ask Sarah. And she has the best web page ever because I saw her out this morning. I love it. It's so, my favorite is like the at the bottom. I need to go back and look at it um, where it says, oh, let me go back to the homepage. I totally have been scouting it out all morning long. <laughs> You have the best pictures. It's the most user-friendly webpage I've ever seen. Um, down at the bottom where it says, oh, where's your cute pictures? Now I can't find it. Like, be bold. Yeah. I love that part of it. Oh, be mindful, be bold, and be inspired. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you love it. I'm actually in the process of, um, I'm going to relaunch it. Um, I well, think I was in love with it already. Yeah, so. I'm going to relaunch it next week. Um, and it's like, it's, I'm hoping actually it'll just become more friendly. So um, on the, you know, not on that front page necessarily, but um, on the, the rest of it, um, I'm just kind of categorizing all of the posts differently so that hopefully people will be able to find what they want and what they need a lot easier. So you're awesome. The part, the one thing I really love too, that I thought would be great for people to share was the ask Sarah first year teachers and their teacher mentors. I love that. Excellent. Yeah, I absolutely, I've been so fortunate to just be able to do different kinds of teacher advocacy work. And to be honest with you, I mean, I've got, you know, like, I've just had amazing, you know, like amazing opportunities. But in terms of writing, um, you know, the, the Ask Sarah work and that column has been really special for me. Um, because it really, for me, is the intersection of, like, insight and experience. Um, I hope that means wisdom. Um, and so it's just, yeah, so I've loved that. Um, it's really pushed me, you know, to think about not only the technical um, part of teaching, not only the art of teaching, but kind of like the spirit of teaching. Um, we talk a lot about the art and science of it. And I don't know that we talk about like the spirit of it enough, although I think we feel it all the time. I don't know if we always name it. And so that work for me has kind of been a place, um, yeah, to dig into that in ways that have felt really um, honest and just really good. Yeah. Well, let me provide a little bit of context for our listeners, just in case someone is listening to this 20 years from now or something. But <laughs> <laughs> we are here on May 1st, 2020 in the middle of this um, COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, really, I, I'm sure that a lot of our conversation will revolve around that. Um, but I guess my first question to you, Sarah, is just, how are you doing? Oh, what a wonderful question. Thanks for asking that. Gosh, you know, we always ask what? You know, <laughs> in fact, I know that I wrote in a journal somewhere. Um, I'll answer your question. But, I, you know, I know I wrote in a journal somewhere that I, I, I wanted to be around people who asked how more than what. I remember writing okay. that down. Hmm. 
Um, so how am I doing? You know, I'm, I, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Um, I, I've been describing it as I'm either like okay or kind of not okay. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that I've had like moments of being, wow, <laughs> you know, um, really, you know, I think there have been certainly, um, I've had moments of connecting with teachers that have filled me up in just really, really important ways, but I don't, yeah, I, I feel like it's like I'm on, an, on a, I'm on a mean or I'm taking little dips, you know, and then I find somebody who kind of helps fill me up and I'm back to that mean again. Um, and I think that's okay. I'm okay with that right now. Yeah. Um, I think that that's, probably pretty accurate for how most people are feeling. And if I, and a lot of people might not even be there. Right. Um, so I, you know, it's been a time of great reflection to be honest with you. Well, okay. So that kind of leads me to my next question is reflection. And we are talking about your website and, and your blog, and you just wrote such a phenomenal letter oh, to your, to your children um, on the 10 year anniversary of your being named, um, 2010 National Teacher of the Year is a great piece. And can you just talk about how you use your blog and your writing um, as a way to reflect? Like, how does that help you grow as a teacher? Oh, I love this question. Um, it is it is as important to me as breathing, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, my One of my favorite authors, my favorite author, Flannery O'Connor, um, she she always said that she didn't understand what she thought until she wrote it down. And I really, um, that really speaks to me because um, for me, ref- I mean, reflection is key, right? I mean, this is, it is, it is the stuff of life. It is the stuff of growth. Um, I think it is our responsibility. You know, I think reflecting is part of our responsibility, not only as getting, getting better as teachers and, you know, educators, but as humans. Um, and for me, being able to write um, helps me to make sense of it. And it helps me to make sense of the things that I can't make sense of. Um, so, so for me, you know, blogging and writing and, and sharing that with people um, has felt really cathartic, um, really instrumental. And I also think just... Um, yeah, just like an extension of myself. I hope that that's how it feels. I hope it feels just like an extension of myself um, more than anything else. My imperfect, my totally imperfect, vulnerable self. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's the awesome thing about blogging right now. I I can attribute, well, actually, I can't really attribute it, but I know that my like growth as a professional started around the same time that I started blogging. And I mm-hmm. I can't say like, Oh, that's what helped me grow professionally, but it also coincided perfectly with the time that I started blogging. So I, um, it's well, it probably great- did because I think you know when we, you know, we as as professionals, we are so hurried, right? Mm-hmm. Everything is so fast, and the process of writing forces you to slow down. It forces you to articulate what you think. Yeah. And as soon as you can articulate what you think, you can start talking to other people about your questions and what you think. And that is the stuff of growth. So when you say that, I, it actually sounds, I mean, I, I think that it makes total sense to me. Well, that those two things would, would have a trajectory. Time, it's wonderful to like reflect what's been working in classrooms and what mm-hmm. we can do online. And then yep. what can we do both things to take forward? Like I think, this is probably the most powerful time to reflect Yep, because it's a simplified time. Yep. Yep. And I've actually even suggested to um, a lot of teachers and, you know, certainly teacher leaders um, that if you're not ready to write, if you're not ready, if you don't feel like you have something to say right now, it's okay. Um, Because what you can be doing is you can be taking notes about where you are. You know, what are you noticing? What are you sensing? And, and then you'll be able to go back and you'll be able to see your patterns. You'll be able to go back and you'll be able to see um, what your journey looked like um, and then be able to share that. Because, you know, we are going to come out the other side of this. Um, I'm not sure when, but I, but, I, but I am full, you know, we are going to come out on the other side of it. 
And when we do, we are going to need the insight of our experiences in order to figure out how to keep moving. Yeah. So I, th I think it's really important just to, just like you said, Jen, just to keep, yeah, noting what's happening. Yeah. What do you think education is going to look like when we do come out of this? What, it, what do you see? Well, I'm going to tell you, I hope it doesn't look the same. I agree. Um, I really hope that it doesn't look the same. Um, there are things that I love about our education system, but mostly, <laughs> mostly what I love is what I see happening in classrooms between teachers and students. You know, this work is human work. Um, at its core, what we do is human work. Um, and so I would love, I mean, I would love to see um, a, a shift in how we think about time. You know, um, I would love to see what would it look like to have more blended classrooms, more asynchronous learning. Um, what would competency based learning look like? You know, I, I hope that this kind of rattles um, our habits enough that we question them. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of, you know, how sometimes when you're teaching and um, especially when you're in your school and you ask somebody, so why is it that we do this? You know, like, why is it we do this? And the person that you ask says, honestly, I have no idea because we've always done it that way. Yeah. And there, and, and the only way to kind of change that is to rattle it a bit and to start to ask, but well, well, why, you know? Um, so I, yeah, I hope we think about time differently. I hope we think about competency differently. Um, I hope that we understand that um, technology and Wi-Fi um, is not a privilege, but a utility. It's a right that every person and every place must have. Um, yeah, I hope we yeah. I hope we ask a lot of those big questions. Yeah, Could, this is maybe um, a, a tough question or I, I don't know. I'm I don't even know how to say it other than mm -hmm. um, I get when i'm on twitter or i'm on social media i get some pushback from teachers saying listen the way that we're doing education through this continuous learning is not equitable therefore we shouldn't do it and it, while i a hundred percent agree without a doubt that it's not equitable at the same time I, I don't think we should shut everything down or what we need to do is find ways to to make it more equitable in my, in my opinion, but, um, but to just say we shouldn't do it because it's not equitable. Well, we've been doing things, um, unequitable for a long time. So oh, yeah, for sure. For <laughs> so sure. That, can you talk about, um, I, yeah. I don't know your thoughts about equity in this strange time of education and yeah. So, you know, I, I always think, I think about this, you know, personally and professionally and just universally that um, when really good things happen or really bad things happen, I think they illuminate what's already there. Yeah. Yeah. So if this is a bad thing that's happening and we're starting to have these conversations about equity, these really tough conversations about equity, like you said, I think it's illuminating the problems that already exist. Um, I think, here's what I think. Um, it's a really tough, it's a really tough question, right? So if you play it out that some people are privileged and even if the, the information, the opportunities you give them are totally optional, if you are privileged and you take advantage of these optional learning, you know, experiences, mm -hmm. your advantage like increases, right? Right. So, I, I mean, I get it. Like, I, I understand the pushback. Um, I also agree with you. That I think it means we have to try harder to figure out how to meet the needs of everyone. And what does that look like? Does that look like Wi-Fi hotspots in places? Does that look like buying devices for students to take home with them? Does that look like, what does that look like? Um, and, and that's what we have to wrestle with. Um, I, I think it's really tough to say, just shut it all down. 
You know, I think saying just shut it all down for me is also kind of dangerous because this is a chance for us to learn. Yeah. This is a chance for us to learn a lot about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I think if we just shut it down, I'm afraid we would just go back to how it was. Yeah. I'm, <clears throat> my biggest concern is things will go back to normal. Yeah. And I don't think, I mean, Justin and I were kind of talking about that before, before you hopped on. First of all, the learning environment, I'm not ready to go back to normal. I think that that's concerning like health wise. Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side of that, there's been a lot of things that I've done online that I actually really enjoy. Yeah. And I, I think, why do kids need to be at school eight to three? Like why? Right. Yep. I yep. think about all the things I'm doing during the day that I, that are killing my time that are right. not meaningful to the learning of kids. Right. And we really boiled it down to good stuff. So I'm, right. I'm afraid if we go back to normal, it's not good. Right. Yep. I also think we're learning. Um, and I can maybe speak to this just as a parent. Um, like what happens when there isn't school? Like how do parents get their work done <laughs> if their kids aren't at school? Right. So we start to like peel the layers of this conversation. And I do think that it gets tricky, right? I think that there it's um, there's just a lot to think about. Um, you know, certainly I'm sure you've heard this too, talking about, especially in secondary schools, you know, I've, I've heard ideas about staggered school experiences where some kids go half of the week, some kids go the other half of the week, you know, I mean, and then what are they doing on the half that they're not there? You know, I um, think how great that would be for like, kids that need to provide for their family. Like I know in my community, yeah. we have a lot of low income. And if you had three days off and you could work yeah. full time for yep. three days. Yep. And if yep. you could get your work done at an ace in an asynchronous way. Sure. Yeah. 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 There's just a lot of facets, but I think, I don't know. I think there's a lot of good that came out of this. I think there can be. I, I think there really can be. I think it, I think how much good is still yet to be seen because I think it's, you know, it'll be interesting to see how we react. Um, and it'll just be interesting to see how willing we are to do some of the, the brave work. Yeah. Well, what, um, when I talk to my brothers, they, they're like, Oh, you're in, you're in education. So you don't have to work now the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the year. And I'm like, um, no, actually it's kind of the opposite of that. Um, yeah. I've been struggling being a dad, yeah. being a principal, um, just trying to take care of all these responsibilities, trying to keep everyone safe, trying to find food, right. <laughs> go to the grocery store and they're all out. Like it's, yeah. uh, it's been kind of chaotic. Um, and so one of the things I think that's really important is that we, we help take care of each other or help take care of ourselves. So can you talk a little bit about what you might be doing to um, take care of yourself and make sure that your needs are met and um, you're not just being swallowed up by the craziness of the situation? Yeah, I, I will say I think one of the most important things that I'm doing um, it, for me is giving myself a little bit of quiet time every day. That's really important for me. Um, so I, I'm actually a runner, although I'm injured right now, so I'm not running, but, um, no. in lieu of that, um, which really is, is usually my quiet kind of thinking time. Um, yeah, so I've been starting my days differently. Um, I've been reading a lot of poetry. I mean, I'm a high school English teacher, um, <laughs> but I've been reading a lot of poetry in the mornings just to kind of get quiet. And I think that's really been helpful for me. Um, and I, but I, I have to say probably, you know, other than that, it has been to lower my expectations for myself in a way that allows me to be kind to myself. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm, you know, I'm not a person to like pass judgment on others, but I'm pretty quick to pass judgment on myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've had to really be mindful of that. Cause to be honest with you, I'm not doing a great job as a homeschool, as a homeschool teacher, which is, there's a whole lot of irony in that statement. Um, and I, and I'm not, and you know, part of the reason, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and so I've had to swap out, you know, kind of the lessons that are provided with like Sarah lessons. Yeah. You know, so I've had to swap yeah. out the, you know, instead of the math lesson, 
Um, I'm teaching my son how to bake and he's doing fractions that way. And, you know, so there are things like that that I'm just having to do. Um, and there's a part of me that feels really good about it. And there's a part of me that feels really guilty about it. And so um, that's my, that honestly is one of the most important things for me has been to just not pass judgment on myself. Yeah, that's, that's tough. So what do you, what does your day look like with your kids? Like as a parent and as a teacher, yeah. how, how are you juggling the at home Yes. Like? <laughs> okay. Curious so you're going to get normal. the bad. You're you're probably really, get... really question. <laughs> no, you're going to get the, you're going to get the gnarly here. Okay. So I let my, my kids, uh, my kids days, their, their hours have really shifted. I have older kids. So I have a 16, a third, almost 14 and a 10 year old. And so I'm letting them stay up later at night. Um, and I'm letting them put themselves to bed because then I can get up really early. <laughs> <laughs> so they're sleeping in, um, you know, we all, the, the alarms go off for them at 930, but that means I've already gotten in um, a good chunk of work time, right? So that's been really good. Um, and then for the most part, what I'm doing is I'm, I have a post-it note for each of them and it's got a short list of things. Um, so they've got a couple of chores to do and then they have a couple of learning options. Um, and they get to pick and, you know, and there are things that are ra range from bake banana bread with mom, um, to, um, watch a documentary and talk to me about it. Um, read for an hour of the book of your choice. Um, do some of the math, you know, that your teacher is sending you, um, uh, revise your national history day project. <laughs> you know, I mean, so there's just been like, um, you know, find something to teach me. Um, make a PowerPoint presentation about that dog you want so bad. Um, you know, just like those kinds of things. And, and it's been okay. Like that's been the most successful has been like a small, a very small number of things for them to choose from, like the things they have to do. And then a few things for them to choose from. I think and we so hear my a lot day of is like nine 30, they get up, they get their lists, they do their things. Um, and then I'm still working a ton. So uh, you know, there's, we're just maneuvering with each other. There's a, you know, a real bad meltdown every couple of days, everybody loses it and we got to go to our separate corners. And That's pretty back. good if it's only every couple of days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then we have a lot of family time house. and it's been really good. You know, that's been wonderful. We're playing a lot of board games. Yeah. We have this family challenge. We're trying to play every board game in the house. Yeah, that's so yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I think I that's what I think. There's some really great that has come out of this. Like I don't get me wrong, I'm dying for a trip to Target or Hobby Lobby. But <laughs> on the flip side, like I've really kind of enjoyed not feeling bad for being home right. and yeah. connecting and doing things that we normally don't do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you know, I, I mentioned the ages of my children. Um, so basically, when I basically I live in my car, you know, we, I haven't in these last, you know, six, seven weeks, but you know, otherwise I'm just, I live in my car because they all have activities and they're all going to different places. And, you know, like the, just like every morning you wake up to the calendar and I think, can I even get through this day? Mm -hmm. Um, and to have that alleviated has been really nice. I was telling a friend of mine that it feels to me so much like my own childhood and it has made me kind of nostalgic and sentimental for my, you know, for my children to have an experience that reminds me of my childhood, which was like, you know, in the summer we didn't go to camps or anything. We just like mom took us to the park and we like had to figure out what to do, you know, like go count snails. I don't like that. I mean, that kind of stuff, you know, like it was just, and it was okay. And I, and I really am appreciating something similar. Um, for my kids right now. Yeah. One of the blog, I kind of shifting the questions, but one of the yeah. things on your, um, that you speak about is getting better and rethinking yeah. how to get better as a teacher. So how, how are you, how do we grow as professionals during this time? You know, I haven't been around, I mean, thank God for zoom, but I was telling Justin earlier, I'm kind of zoomed out. Like yeah. I, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm getting to the point where I'm like, when well, somebody wants to zoom, I'm like, Oh, I don't know. Yeah. But how do we grow as professionals during this time? 
I mean, I think it could be a great time for us to really stretch our wings. This time is either going to be really great for teachers. It's going to push the ones that want to grow. And the ones that don't are going to sit back and just ride the wave of loading stuff on, on your learning management system. Yeah. Being done. yeah. So how do we grow? Well, I think there are different ways to grow. Um, and I think the, you know, certainly one of them I kind of already talked about, which is reflection. Um, and, and being able to, to ask yourself how, you know, what, what's working here? What isn't working here? Why is it working? Why is it not working? Um, and to be able, I think, to put yourself in conversations with people that help you dig, right? So getting better means being okay with the uncomfortable. I think that, um, you know, so much of our, in many ways, our system has indoctrinated us into the idea that uncomfortable is bad. Even though teachers talk about being uncomfortable as a good thing, I don't think our systems do, right? Our systems, they really like things to be in boxes. They really like to check things off. They really like to be able to prove to other people, like, this is what we're doing and this is what what growth looks like. And it's just so much messier than that. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of growth, being able to reflect individually is really important. Um, I am actually a big fan of Voxer, the app Voxer, um, and, and certainly as an alternative to Zoom, um, where you can find a person or a couple of people to just have conversations with, right? Um, some of the my professional learning network, right? Um, I would say many of our conversations start off kind of personal and then they, they, they still always morph into the professional because we have, you know, we have that in common. And um, so being connected, I think, in conversation is really important. Um, and then I also really think, and I love to do this myself and I'd like to encourage other teachers to do it, um, but to learn something new yourself. So whether it's you want to be a better reader, if you're a reading teacher, you want to become a better writer, if you're a writing teacher, if you want to think you want to be a better scientist because you're a science teacher, now's the time to do it. And even if none of those things are work, but you want to learn to play the drums, then go figure it out. <laughs> um, but pay attention to what it feels like to learn. Because ultimately, when we are in the classroom, we are not supposed to just turn the page in the book, right? We are supposed to be lead learners. And the best way we can do that is understand what it what understand a process of learning. Yeah. Um, and so just putting ourselves and I, I tell people this all the time, put yourself in the way of struggle, put yourself in the way of struggle. And I think if we can do that, we are doing the work of getting better. Yeah. I, I love what you're saying. And um, you should know that Jen Farr is, uh, I don't know, a leader in Kansas as far as boxers. She has a boxer group that um, they contribute. I love boxer. I love conversation. it. Conversation. So that's awesome. Alley. Yeah. One of my friends that was on uh, the teacher of the year team with me, we box every morning on our way to work and we have fallen out of that habit because I'm not, because you're not going to work. Not going anywhere. Right. And I will tell you, I've missed it. Yeah. I've missed, um, like, like we, like you said, we talk personal, but then we also, that tree that morphs through the day. It like, how was is. your yep. day? What did you do? You know? And then it turns into, well, I think this about this and you kind of challenge each other's thinking. I don't know. It's a good debrief. Yeah, I agree. But I think you're actually also like mentioning something that's really important for us to think about, which is our own kind of, you know, our, our homes are systems too, right? The way our, our, our home lives and our families or are organized, that's a system too. And when school changed, home changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about managing the change of multiple systems. Um, and I, I really struggled at first with my morning routine also, because I had a really good morning routine. It put me in the right place every morning and then it was totally upended. Um, but I do think it's important to think about when would you have that conversation now? 
You know, is it while you're making dinner? Is it when you walk to the mailbox? Is it like, I, you know, what, what is the tiny little, and I, I talk about stealing moments, stealing minutes all the time to do important work. Um, and I, and I think that, you know, if we can get into the habits of reinstating those things that really fill us up, um, it's, it's really important because it, I those are the that, things that will sustain us. I think we have guilt for yeah. not being as busy. And I think we have guilt also for stopping and like saying, I have to work. Like mm -hmm. I need to do this. I need, like I have guilt when I'm like, okay, but this is my time. I, I really, this is my job. Right. And it's hard. It is. You know, I am, um, when I was a first year teacher, I learned this important lesson. Um, I was, well, I was a little bit crazy for quite a few years. In my opinion. Um, but the crazy one, you national teacher of the year. So I, I say ride the crazy train as long as, you as long as I needed to. Um, but I was very convinced that basically I needed to spend every waking minute in school, like, right. Being, figuring out how to be a better teacher. Yeah. Um, because I, I could, see, you know, this is the thing I could see it but I could also see how big it was and how far away that was for me. Um, and I went to this, and one of my, my mentor teacher my first year said, I'm sending you to a training. I'm supposed to go to it, but I'm sending you in my place. I'm like, okay. And it was um, a Stephen Covey training. And there's a lot that I don't remember about it, but I remember one thing really, really well. Um, I remember that we were supposed to make these four quadrants, and I don't even remember what the quadrants were. Um, but ultimately what I learned was that if I was doing just the work of being human, I was doing the work of school. Um, because if I went to a movie instead of wrote a perfect rubric, right? I could write an okay rubric or a per perfect one. Um, if I went to a movie instead, I would actually have more to talk to my students about. And that was a human thing and a really good thing. And if I went to a baseball game, instead of um, finishing grading those papers tonight, then I could talk to my students about it the next day, right? Or especially if they were playing in it, or if I went to a play or, you know, and, um, and it really, that, that really was important for me. And then I also, about that time, read for me what has been my, the most important teaching book that, that I've read, um, it's called The Courage to Teach by Parker Palmer. And he talks about, he says that we teach who we are. Um, and it's been really clear to me the years that I wasn't as good of a teacher, I just wasn't as good of a human. Mm. And, yeah. and I didn't have a lot to teach from, right? When I wasn't just being Sarah and cultivating a, a, a human life, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't as available to kids. Um, and I think we have to reorient what we think work looks like as a that, teacher. That's so deep right now, Sarah, because when we start thinking about what the future of education looks like or what education looks like post COVID-19 and, um, what's the direction that some go is, oh, awesome. We can just do this electronically and create this system and our kids can go through this system and, um, we can probably cut back on staff because we can just have these videos available and it's the exact opposite of what teaching is the human aspect. And it's why, you know, some are worried that maybe teachers will be replaced by machines. And I think it's an impossible thing. I think to be human is exactly what teaching is. And, and if we, and it, <laughs> Darn it, I'm going to get on my math soapbox for a second here. <laughs> but if we're trying to teach kids to compete with machines yeah. and do calculations faster than a machine can do calculations, then we will lose every single time. I think yeah. what we really have to focus on is how can we help our students be more human and forget competing against the machines. The only thing that we can beat the machines at is being human. And so... Yep finding ways to, to make connections and to, to uh, the way you put it is, is perfect is just be as 
authentic and human as, as you can be. So well, what I you know, the same way, oh, go ahead, Sarah. I was going to say the same way that our system has taught our, our students that they have to be busy all the time. You know, that, that same system has taught teachers that being busy all the time makes you a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think we have yeah. to be really cautious about own, like about letting that seep into our consciousness too much. Um, because like I said, being a good teacher, um, really is so much bigger than, yeah, it's just, it's, it's so much bigger than, than the busyness. I've asked my kids what they've missed most. And now I teach fifth grade, so I mean, it's a little different, but <laughs> they, they don't miss the content. They're still getting the content. We're still reading a novel online. What they're missing is talking about the books. Mm -hmm. um, because I can't emulate that in the, I mean, I can try in a flip grid or an online discussion and we've tried, mm -hmm. um, but kids don't, they don't type 14 sentences. They're just going to type the minimum. Right. And the other thing is I, I teach in a military community and one of my kids is leaving to go to Washington and he misses saying goodbye, even though he's yeah. two streets down from me, that has bothered him the most was not saying goodbye. Yeah. And I think Hopefully, I think I'm hoping our decision makers in education are seeing how valuable the other stuff is. Right, absolutely. That it's trumping test scores. It's trumping all of that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think that's really, um, again, I think you're picking up on one of the things that's so difficult, but we're not really quite talking about, which is kind of this human need for closure. Mm -hmm. um, that we just, we have a lot of need um, for closure in order to keep moving. And I think we feel just kind of in the wind, you know, I think we feel just kind of, um, yeah, just a little bit lost there because we, we're, we don't have closure to school years. We don't have closure, in, you know, in terms of saying goodbye, the, you know, I think about, gosh, the, the seniors, my seniors, oh. um, what, you what have that senior? loss of closure means. But is yours a senior this year? No, my, my son is not a senior, but I teach, but I teach high school. How are they navigating that? I'm curious how other states are looking. Um, Illinois just said absolutely zero in person. I saw that statement issued last night. Yeah, I don't think that there. I don't think that there will be any in person. I know that we are not, and I know, um, but I haven't heard that any. I don't think any school in the Des Moines area will do that. I don't know if there are some smaller schools in different places. I, I'm not sure about that, um, but I would anticipate no in person graduations at all. I think that that's what this whole COVID thing is about. Is like, like you said, closure and human. Mm -hmm. Even like, as Justin was talking about the calculation and the need for the human interaction, if you look at who's like, we're trying to come up with vaccinations and cures and what, mm -hmm. what we can do to the antibodies, that's really humans working together to help, um, help our society. Yeah. And so I think that that's way more than the content knowledge. Oh, certainly. I mean, and I think it's, you know, we also, I think are understanding the difference between content and skill in a different way. So, you know, I, like Justin said, I think some teachers are nervous that they could be replaced, right? Well, here's the thing. Um, could we be more um, effective or efficient in delivering content? Probably. Are there some resources we might create or learn from this experience that could help us with content? I think so. Um, however, you, you can't replace, I don't, I don't think you can replace skill building. Yeah. Like you still need a person there to say, hey, this is not where your hand goes on the saw. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're learning to weld. This is, this is, like, I, I can't just have you watch a YouTube video and then expect you to go do that on your own, yeah. you know? Um, and, and if that doesn't work in industrial tech and if that doesn't work in, you know, art or music, it should not work in math or social studies or science or literature, right? Or language arts. Yeah. I love it. And, and when you're talking about competency based and how we can learn from this experience and get better at, at, assessing competencies and, and those kinds of things. I think that that's, that's what I think of is 
Um, these skills are more than just content. It's how do you know, how do I improve on this? And that, and you're right. It needs a human connection to, to make that work. Not just a YouTube video. Yep. I agree. I so agree. All right. Well, we're getting towards the end here and, um, I, I'm just going to turn it over to you, Jennifer, because I, I always steal your question. <laughs> I always, my, always my last question is, but this is, it's going to look different this time. My last question yeah. is always, I'm going to go to my classroom tomorrow, which I'm actually going to walk down the hall to my dining room and go back to work. Yeah. But what, what's my, what do I do next? What are my next steps? What should a teacher do? What's my biggest takeaway? Um, I mean, no, I, I think love the problem me, reflection. I really need to be working on that. And I think I need to be a blogging. I really do. That's been yeah. on my heart for a while. Yeah, but you should be ta or talking, right? We're or talking, boxing, right? Or um, but tell tell me if I'm a first year teacher, third year teacher, or thirty year teacher. Mm -hmm. What do I? What's my next steps? Maybe um, as I go back in August, or um, tomorrow as I wake up and try to navigate online learning. Yeah. Well, I will tell you that what I'm thinking about right now um, is closure. To be honest with you, I really am thinking about. Um, what will it look like to pull together whatever experience this has been, you know, for my students? And honestly, at this point, students have chosen different experiences, you know, and which is in a lot of ways not any different than when we're face to face. Some students choose to check out <laughs> and some students yeah. don't. Um, and so, but I'm really thinking a lot about what that looks like. What, what does closure look like? Um, I don't know if I have any great ideas. Um, I, you know, I've been tossing around, you know, some, you know, some things, maybe some things I need to send to them individually or collectively. Um, I had a friend who sent me an actual postcard the other day and I was so happy just to see her handwriting. I was like, ah! And it just reminded me about how powerful that kind of a connection is. Um, so I've been thinking about, you know, what does a handwritten, you know, what does a handwritten goodbye um, look like? Um, so, but then I think about um, August, right? So I think about what will August look like? Um, and I will tell you one of the things that happened to me a few years ago. Um, so my high school we ran out of space and so we had to build a new high school and we went from one building to the next you know and in that process i have this i have this hybrid job um and in that process i lost my classroom and it was seriously devastating like yeah <laughs> i seriously sobbed for three days while I was packing up the house. My, you know, I like, I would just sobbed and, um, and I had to get rid of stuff. And I, and then as I was like starting that purging process, it was like, um, an evolutionary purging process. Cause once I started, um, I realized I, I had to fit everything in one desk. So we have some kind of shared learning spaces. So I had to fit everything in a desk and then, you know, I bought, I have a cart and then like one little storage thing. And so I just started throwing stuff away and I hired one of my former students to take all of my file cabinets and scan them. Um, <laughs> and so I went paperless. I went totally paperless. Um, and it was a really hard shift. Because, and the hardest shift was the workflow shift. Like, how do you hand stuff out and pick it back up and give it back to them with meaningful feedback in ways that don't kill you? <laughs> um, and so, honestly, this is what I think teachers need to think about, though. Because, um, I, so ever since then, even my face, to, so my face-to-face -face classes have been parallel online. And I, I think we have to be ready to, I think we have to be ready for this to happen again. Yeah. So when teachers go back in the fall, when I go back in the fall, this is what I'm going to be thinking about. Yeah. Um, what will it look like? How will I start things so that if one Thursday afternoon, I find out we're not coming back on Monday, we have to, we have to be okay. We have to be okay. 
Yeah. I think you have to build, I was thinking about that too. And I thought how quickly I'm going to have to build relationships and rapport. Yep. We're just a simple fact that this comes back quickly in the fall. Yep. I need to have that relationship with them yep. so I can quickly make the move. Right. It's not the content right. I'm worried about. It's right. just- well, and I think that's also really important. This is one of the huge ahas for me um, that has been a wonderful affirmation. It's been really clear to me that the relationships I took the time to build slowly um, are really paying off now. Mm-hmm. Because the 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 students that especially like I was able to form that relationship with, they're still working. They're still doing stuff for no credit, for no points, right? Yeah. Um, and and I think, and that's slow work, you know. Um, and I and I think we have to remember that in the fall, because it might be really tempting to say, okay, so just in case we're, you know, just in case we lose a month of school, I'm going to double up on the content. We're going to get ahead. And you forget to build those relationships and then you're really in trouble. Mm -hmm. You're really, really in trouble because it is the relationship that's going to sustain you. It's not the content. Yeah. Yeah. And with parents. Yeah, absolutely. Started early with parents talking and so, so they understand your vision and what you're right. trying to do. So they're absolutely. not frantic at home. They understand yep. where you're coming from. Yep. Absolutely. I have the smartest friends because I, <laughs> I would not have even thought about how, how important it will be to, I mean, I know relationships are important. I'm not saying that, but to like be intentional and think about how important relationship building will be at the start of next year. Yeah. And you guys, you guys are geniuses. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your brains with me for a little bit. Well, Sarah, Sarah, it was so fun to talk to you. Yes. Oh, it's great to talk to you, Sarah. We really this appreciate it. What if someone wants to connect with you on online, what where can they find you? Twitter? They can website? find me everywhere. They can <laughs> find me on Instagram, uh, Sarah Brown Wesling. You can find me on Twitter, Sarah B. Wesling. Um, Facebook, I have um, a personal page, but then at my uh, education page is Sarah Brown Wesling Teaching and Learning, and my website sarahbrownwesling.com. It's it's not that creative. I think it's adorable. Yes, go check it out, friends. Go check it out. <laughs> Thank you both so much. What a joy this is. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Be safe. <laughs>